Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, Hi. everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you enjoy the workshop as much as we will, uh, you know, sharing our experiences and knowledge with you. Uh, but first, because I know we didn't take a break, I want everyone to please stand up. Everyone, please, please stand up for a little bit. Okay, please, please stand up, and we're going to do some stretches. Duki, you want to guide? Yeah. You just raise your hand, you just stretch. Hi, 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 very high. Yeah. Now to one side. Yeah. Right. Now to the other side. Okay, go to the left and to the right as well. Anything next? Down, down, down. Yeah. Uh, I'm not that flexible. Maybe some of you are. <laughs> okay, are we feeling a little bit more refreshed now? Yeah. And we're ready to get on it? Yes. All right. You can all... You can, yeah. you can sit down. Sit down. So welcome to our session. What we're going to be doing today is talking about brainstorming, diversity, protection, and inclusion through sports the science thinking approach. And as I said, my name is Mercedes Harrow. I am the IOC Young Leader representing Guatemala and Peru. Um, just to give you a brief introduction about my project, it is called uh, Talent on the Move or Talento en Movimiento. And what I aim to do through my project is to enhance the safe and protection of migrant children that are going from Central America all the way to the United States on foot with their families, so they have to endure a lot of risks during this journey, and I want to provide them with a, a sports activities that actually make them feel safer and better, and somehow cope with positive mechanisms through sports, so that they can overcome these difficulties. Yeah, so a little bit... Uh, that slide before. Yeah. So a little, um, I'm Duki Len Jivamani, you can call me Duki for short, and I'm from Singapore, and I'm the founder of The Possible Play. So a little bit about the possible play. We're a um, social enterprise in Singapore. We um, offer football programs to kids. And what we do is we teach them leadership and communication skills uh, through football um, in a really safe and um, inclusive environment where girls and boys play together rather than you have um, a boy team and a female team. And also a little bit about the program in case you were not able to attend the session yesterday. Yep, so we are 25 young leaders from 25 countries. Um, all of us come from different backgrounds, different sports, and uh, what made this group special was that we are a pandemic group. So we actually um, spent two years online on Zoom. And this year was the first time that we were actually all in a group at Lausanne um, in the Olympic House. And we all met for the first time and we Immediately, we clicked together and we, um, the passion for sports um, was there from the start and we were able to communicate throughout the three days about what we're doing and what we're doing back home as well. So basically, the IOC Young Leaders, uh, it's helping young people like ourselves and all around the world to implement a sports project so they can make changes in their local communities. Um, and part of what we represent and what we work, and this is kind of like the table of contents, are the values-based principles from Olympism. So this is what we're going to be talking about today. We're also going to guide you through the design thinking process. We're going to have a, a couple of exercises, problem statements on how you can think about your projects and the problems that you want to solve in your communities. Then we're also going to brainstorm and see how we apply those principles through our, you know, prototyping and the products that we create or the services that we want to create to solve or tackle these uh, issues. So this is kind of like the agenda. And to start, as I mentioned, we want to talk about Olympism and value-based principles, which are basically the overarching themes um, that should be applied in any partnership or in any project that aims to use sports as a tool for development. These uh, principles, as you can see, are the DNA of Olympism. All of them, they are 
transversal and they are cross-functional, meaning they interfere or they inter, um, interact with each other. So, for example, if you're talking about gender equality, you might also as well in, uh, talk about sustainability or have considerations about inclusion. Or, for example, if you're working on safe sport, then you, of course you want to tackle also gender equality and inclusion and sustainability. So all of them are interconnected. And at the same time, because the sports, as we have been talking this, uh, this past days, um, sport is an enabler for reaching and achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals, or the SDGs, as we call them. We also work by applying these principles into achieving the SDGs. Also, this is part or is at the core of the Olympic movement, and this is what we call Olympism 365, which aims to bring the impact of sports closer to the people in all spheres of society, including education, health, uh, and inclusion. And also, this is as well because we are very well familiarized with the benefits of sports and how it is very helpful for the individual to have an active life, to have a health life, it also helps with psychosocial well-being, with mental being, with inclusion, promoting gender equality and all of this. So it also helps, as I'm mentioning, to achieve, uh, you know, the SDGs. And over here in the, in the screen, you can see some of them. All of our projects, the 25 of us, through our projects, are somehow tackling or supporting uh, achieving 10 of the, of the 17 SDGs. So to go a little bit more in depth about each principle, uh, we have first the Olympic values, excellence to be the better version of yourselves. We have friendship, which is all about solidarity and team spirit. And we also have respect, which is not respect only for oneself, but for the others, for your opponent, for the rules of the games, um, for the nature, for everything that is around you. And this is also reflected in educational principles like the joy of effort, respect for others, fair play, pursuit of excellence, and balance between body, will, and mind. The next of the principles is gender equality, and actually this one is one of the priorities of the Olympic movement, but also of the International Olympic Committee. And uh, this is one of the areas in which they have been trying to move towards more inclusion of women. There are some parts in the world where 2% or less of women have access to practice a sport. And I don't know if someone here can tell me, do you know how long it took for women to participate in all sports in the Olympic program? Can anyone take a guess? Give me a number. A number. Three. More, more, more. Another number. How many years it took? Ten? Okay. Twenty? Not even close. You're getting closer. Anyone else? One last guess? One last guess? No, no, no. We were already at 100. Anyone else? 100. No, you went too far. <laughs> Actually, it was 116 years. This was achieved until London 2012, when they were able to have women participating in all the, sp in all the sports in the Olympic program. So they have really come a long way in trying to push for more gender equality. The next one is inclusion. Inclusion is about making sure everyone feels in a safe space to participate. They, they are considered on an equality and in a fair way so that they can all participate and feel safe to do it regardless of their gender, their religion, or their ethnicity. And something very important about inclusion is that it's not only inclusion in terms of the participants and the people that is part of your program, but also about the larger community. You also need to consider the friends, the family, and the communities themselves because they have an impact of the participants in your project. For example, some of the risks sometimes is that students or women will drop out of sports activities because sometimes, you know, your family or your parents might think you're wasting your time on playing sports instead of studying. But when you actually also make the parents part of this journey and you include them in your project, they will see the benefits of sports in their children, how, you know, they learn values that they can also later apply in life. Um, so it is this whole idea of inclusion from the individual to the larger groups. 
And then we also have the principle of safe sport. Safe sport refers to making sure you can play sports in a safe place that is free of danger, that it is uh, in proper condition for you to practice a sport, but it also is in the mental well-being of the participants, making sure they, there is no discrimination, no harassment, nothing that will cause distress to the participants, so they, they can also feel that they have psychological support if needed. This is also making sure that if your participants need uh, a specialized support and they can be referred to this, you have to have child protection policies in place. Coaches need to be also trained on first aid. So this is everything when it comes to making sure the individual is physically safe, but also mentally safe as well. The next of the principles is also very important for the IOC, which is sustainability. This means being conscious about the environment, reducing the negative impact of our activities or of our sports, for example, when you host mega sports events. Also, it is about raising awareness about these issues. Sports is really a perfect vehicle to raise awareness about uh, sustainability and being responsible, for example, like improving waste management practices, re recycling as well. And also, it is important to mention that sustainability now also, as you can see, has been really embedded into the hosting of the games. Since a city wants to, or a country wants to be the host of the Olympic Games, when they are preparing to submit their bid, they also have to consider sustainability. They have to consider sustainability also during the delivery of the games and even afterwards. And this has to be also economically sustainable. And another important aspect of sustainability that, should, that we should be aware as well is how climate change is impacting the way we engage in sports. This is also why it's important, because if it's too hot outside, for example, or if it's flooded, then you're not going to be able to go outside and play. So environment and climate change is affecting the way in which we engage in sports. And then the last one is about partnerships, because it's not about what you can do alone, but also what you can do with others, trying to build on each other's strengths finding for the right resources in your networks, and also this will help you with better uh, allocation of the resources in the sense that there will be, you can avoid duplication, you know, if you know what everyone else is doing, then you can actually, you know, find where there is gaps and collaborate to fill these gaps. So it is all about this collaboration and partnerships within the Olympic movement, with other nonprofit organizations, government, schools, etc. So as you can see, all of them are in a way kind of like interconnected, but they are all very important. And now we'll show you a little bit more on how we can think about these principles when we apply them into our own projects. Okay. So, yeah. So now we look at um, what is design thinking, um, how do we apply it, and what are the steps to design thinking. So if you look at the picture, um, what if we don't change at all and something magical just happens? So if you face a problem, um, do you just leave it as it is or do you find a solution to the problem? So most of the time we try to find a solution to a problem and design a thinking approach is um, one of the ways that we can actually um, use it as a solution. So um, yeah, hum to do design thinking, you actually must have a human-centered design mindset. Um, so what that means is rather than thinking and talking, we try to um, learn along the way while we're doing it. So we can actually constantly learn while, while we're doing it and get feedbacks at the same time. And one of the amazing things about human-centered mindset is that we actually think about um, people's um, feelings such as empathy and also we have like optimism, um, how to learn from failures, how to, how to be confident as well. So we are thinking about the people rather than ourselves. So yeah. Design thinking in five steps. So we have empathizing, uh, define, um, ideate, prototype, and test. So um, these five steps don't have to be in a linear process. It's, it's, rather, than, uh, it's rather like a guide. So if let's say if you're um, in define and you're at prototype, you can always uh, go back to define and then um, yeah, empathize as well. It's not, it's not like a step one, step two, step three kind of thing. So um, I'll go a bit more into design thinking. So empathizing. Uh, empathizing is it's to, to understand your user, to seek to understand. There's no judgment. It's, it's, um, it's a very emotional thing. And then when you go to define, you look at uh, user needs and in, uh, insight. 
um, how do you define your project, how do you design um, the solution or things like this. And then when you go to ideate, you're thinking about um, solutions, um, you're brainstorming, it's, it's a really open concept. You have a lot of people with you and um, you, you're just sharing ideas. And then when you come to prototype, um, you've got to keep it simple. You've got to have data for it, so you're always uh, testing when you're doing your proto prototype. Sorry. And then when you go to your test, um, feedback is really important, and also you're refining your solutions. So um, like I said, design thinking is um, not a linear process where it's just A, B, C. It's more of um, um, having it as a guide so that you're always um, going step one to step three, step three to step one. So now we look at problem statement. So once we have um, understood what is design thinking, we actually can go into problem statement and what actually it is. So problem statement is a human-centered description about your stakeholder needs. It outlines the core problem of your stakeholder as well as your intention. So um, for my case, I wanted to know um, in Singapore um, how many girls are actually playing sports. So for me to do this is I need to actually understand um, the yeah, my stakeholders, which are the parents, are they interested in sending their girls to football programs in Singapore? And from then, I'm actually having that intention of, of creating that program. Yes, so once you have created your, uh, once you have understood your problem statement, is to um, basically understand your end goal. What is your end goal? So for my case in Singapore, my end goal is to empower girls. But how am I going to do that? And that's when I create a problem statement. So in problem statement, there are three steps. First, you ask yourself a question, how can I empower young girls? This is the first step. And then you have a call to action, which is let's empower young girls by helping them to be more self-confident. And then the third point is, is called the point of view. Young girls need support in overcoming gender bias obstacles at, and gaining self-confidence. So once we understand these three steps, we are able to actually have this intention of what we are going to create um, for our prototype. And once you've created that, that problem statement, you actually understand what is your end goal. So the social enterprise that empowers children and girls from the ages of 5 to 16 years old. And also you need to know what you're going to offer them and what, what, is it, what value you're going to teach them. So teaching them leadership and communication skills through football programs. I'll pass on to um, Mercedes who will share her problem statement as well. So to give you another example of how I did this process for my project, uh, understanding your end goal. My end goal is to enhance the safety and protection of migrant children. So then I started asking myself, how can we support migrant children and avoid exposing them to further harm? And then my call to action was to provide meaningful engagement through sports activities for children to help them develop, develop their skills and capacities. In my point of view, migrant children need safe spaces where they can build their skills and leadership capacities. And then through my end goal and through my project, is a project focused in increasing the protection and well-being of migrant children between the ages of 10 and 17 in Guatemala, providing sports activities through which migrant children can develop their skills and receive adequate support and guidance. Anyone has any question at this point about the process or the values or anything? Anyone? Don't be shy. Could be anything or anything that you're unsure about at the moment, at current. Okay, because we are going to have some time for all of us to do it. Yes. So you will have your own time to think about a problem statement, but we want to make sure you feel comfortable before we dive into the next part as well. Yep. Okay. Okay, so once we've created our problem statement, um, the next step is to brainstorm inclusion and safe spot. So this, this part, it could be anything, um, um, any value that is um, applicable to your project. It could be sustainability, it could be um, yeah, inclusion, safe spot, things like this. So um, what we want to try to do in this part is to um, ensure that we are incorporating our values in the project. So for my case in Singapore, I want to ensure that there's a good mix of races per group. So this actually touched on inclusion. So um, if you're in a multiracial country, you have different races and you want to ensure that all of them are in the same group. And um, if gender equality is your 
your focus than a good mix of female and male players per group. Um, so you have, let's say if you have five per group, you want to have three girls and two boys, or maybe two girls or three boys. And then you want to have also uh, more female coaches because these um, girls, when they are playing football, they are more comfortable going up to female coaches and um, speaking to them about their day or anything that is, um, um, that is affecting them. And lastly, no winners and no losers. So this is really important to me because um, growing up in a competitive environment, there's always winner and loser um, in elite sports. So what we want to do is want to erase that till like um, when they are growing up, um, five to 16 years old. So we ensure that in every game, there are no winners and losers. And this actually create an equal competitive because we actually see um, um, things like more goals, um, people, you know, fighting with each other because everyone is also equally competitive. So that's, um, it's a win-win situation for me and also for the players. Yep. So in my case, similarly, I'm focusing on safe sports again, but that doesn't mean I don't touch on the others. So as well for gender equality and also for inclusion, I need to make sure I include children from different ethnic groups or also coming from different nationalities as well but also I need to ensure access to referral and support systems for participants. As I mentioned, I'm working with migrant children who have probably you know, been through family separation or they have been stranded somewhere that is not their community or not their country of origin. So I need to make sure that if they need a specialized support, this is available. So they, they need to be aware that these systems exist. The coaches or the trainers that are working with them, they need to make sure this exists. Also, I need to encourage the engagement from family and community members. As I mentioned, some of the children are coming from different uh, nationalities. Or, so th all of them, they need to you know, make sure that the community is welcoming them. Sometimes there is problems between host communities when there are immigrants that are coming to the, you know, the, the newcomers into the communities. So I also need to engage them to make sure there is social cohesion. I also need to engage the families. Some of these children have been, uh, you know, been away from their families or they suffer loss. So we need to make sure that if there is any like uh, family member, they can also be supported towards the children. And also I need, as I mentioned, trained coaches on safeguarding and protection of young people. So there needs to be child uh, protection policies in place, but the coaches also need to know how to respond. For example, if one of the children uh, feels really sad or starts crying or something's happened with them, they need to know how to deal with it to ensure that they that the youth or the child will be, you know, taken care of. Are there any questions at this stage? Anyone? Any questions or... Don't be shy. If you any... need to translate your question as well, we can take the time. Yep. All good? Yep. Okay. <laughs> so once we're done with understanding design thinking, um, creating a problem statement, as well as um, formulating, um, brainstorming uh, inclusion and safe sport, we are now at a stage where we want to build a prototype product and service to, for your social business or your social project. So for my case, the possible play, um, which is a social enterprise, but um, one of the things that now that I've created it, um, I always ask myself, how did I get there? So when you're always reflecting, you can always use this template called the Build, Measure, Learn loop. So uh, it's a prototype loop that always um, keep you in check wherever you are in your project. You can actually um, refer to it at any stages of your project as well. So, oh, yep. So a little bit more about the Build, me Measure, Learn loop. You have the first step, which is the build. Um, and in build, you have the product. And then you, once you've created your product, you go to measure. You measure the data that um, uh, what you were able to offer and what are some things that you can actually learn from um, the data. And then the third step, yes, uh, learn as well. But in this learning and uh, the measure is different because uh, once, you are, once you are learning, you are actually formulating ideas for your next step. So uh, measure is about learning data, whereas for learn, you are actually um, creating new um, products uh, for your uh, project. So for my build, um, I created holiday boot camps, which is the product, um, the first step. So from here, I actually can learn a, a, a lot about, a lot about uh, my project, such as like the demand, the program structure, coaching structure, and the amount of girls who participated, because uh, gender equality um, is one of my main focus. 
and then uh, measure statistics and the, how many participants are joining your project. So data is really important in, in the current um, stage where we are. So we can actually learn a lot from this, uh, such as satisfactory rate of the bootcamp, interest rate, training structure. So how do I get this uh, data was that I was able to give um, the parents um, feedback forms to complete and this was run through WhatsApp, so I just sent them, and um, the data that I collected from them, I was able to actually understand a lot more on my project. And then uh, measuring girls' participation progress, so this was also um, uh, given, um, this feedback was given through forms, and I actually realized that um, the girls that participated were very significantly lower, so we had a ratio of one girl to six boys for every um, session. And for coaches as well, we had uh, every, for every female coaches, we have six boys. So um, a lot has to be done in terms of um, bringing up the numbers. And in learning, this is the part where actually you're formulating ideas for your next, um, your next part in, in your project. So I was able to actually offer concrete um, eight-week football leadership programs. And in these programs, I, was, um, I focused on two sides, which is the business side and also the... Um, social aspect of it. So the social aspect was um, bringing the girls' number up, which I talked to before, um, which I mentioned before. So a lot of things had to be done, but I did not do it just in the first um, program. As you can see, there's a second edition, third edition that we are currently um, in right now. And at every stage, we are focusing on what we can do more to actually increase uh, female participation in our project. And on the business side, you have to... like. Um, for the first one is sign-ups, second one is profits, and then the third one is profit margin. So you're always actually thinking on what to do next. And when you're at, whenever you're lost in that project, always refer to this loop, where you're always building, measuring, and learning. So you never get lost in your project. Yep. So that's... And since you didn't have any question, that means we are all ready, right? Yep. So we actually want you to think about, even if it's not something as big as a project, yep. to think about an initiative, because this is actually how all ideas start, with like small ideas or a small initiative of any problem that you would like to solve in your community. It could be in your school, it could be in your neighborhood, or it could be in any part of other community that you belong to, that you would like to uh, you know, try to provide a solution by using sports. So we'll give you... Yeah, five to, ten, five to ten minutes now to think about first your problem statement, to think about what is this that you would like to change in your community. So start thinking about it, and if you have any questions, let us know. If anyone can come up with any ideas, you can raise your hand and we can share. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tae Song, and I'm from the South Korea. And I thought about the environment pollution for the our social, social, <laughs> yeah, so actually for the through sports, I thought about the plugging events. It's a um, combination of the jogging and the plugka up for the combination word. So uh, plugging is the, when you walk in the, well, when you walk in the sidewalk or like this, and uh, when you see the trash, just pick up and go up on your right there. So maybe it's um, good to good method to throw spurts for social <laughs> pollution. Yes, it's a great idea. Yeah. So in terms of that, if you're if you're understanding what is the problem is that there are a lot of trash and you're trying to save the environment. So maybe the question we can ask ourselves is like, how can we incorporate jogging and picking up the trash? And then we could have a call to action. Um, let's um, motivate runners in um, picking up trash when they see one when they are running. And a point of view is that more people have to do it so that they can actually save the environment in their community and they can actually have a cleaner place. And what we can actually think and brainstorm in that sense is that we have, um, we could actually approach community leaders and actually put up signages that have 
um, that is along the jogging path that says that pick up a trash if you see one. Because um, um, I understand your point of view because when because living in Singapore, we actually have this. And then um, a lot of times people actually are aware not to litter as well. So um, that could be a start. Um, and yeah, so that's one of the ways we can actually um, create a problem statement and actually start brainstorming solutions from there. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Um, anyone else thought about any other problem in your community? Um, hi, I'm Kyra. So I'm actually thinking of starting a community project to promote inclusivity and give back to the community together with my team. So we actually want to help the disabled and maybe help the public to, um, and help the disabled, um, especially those who lack equal opportunities and hopefully um, get the public to understand the various challenges that they face to get them to become um, a more inclusive society. So what do you think? Also another great idea, thank you. Um, yeah, so the question here would be how to promote the inclusion of more people into this type of activities. And I think um, this is, a, you know, like kind of like the principles that we were guiding, you will need to make sure that there is uh, people that can actually be aware of how to provide support for them. Some also how to make the adaptations, for example, of the type of sports or activities if they need to be adapted. Um, so it will be how to empower people so they can also participate in the, in the activities. Anything you wanna yeah. add? So the thing I want to add is that um, if you're thinking in that, that perspective is to find someone who actually think about doing it as well. And uh, rather than doing it alone, you actually find that another person that could actually help you with it. It could be um, someone that, who's already part of the... the um, um, yeah, part of the, the movement as well, or the project, and you can actually um, tap on um, sharing skills and actually work towards it. So how I actually created my project was that um, I actually spoke to someone who was actually having, who actually was already doing it, and I actually approached him and actually asked him, um, how do I, how do I um, start this, and how do I um, um, actually yeah, create a, a project that actually helps um, young girls. And um, from what I know in, in, in Singapore, there are a lot of um, people with um, unequal opportunities in the disabled um, zone area. And um, you can actually start straight away. And um, there's a lot of um, movement to it. And a lot of people actually, you would be surprised, that would actually want to take part and um, um, help you out with this. With this. Yes, thank you. I actually do have a team that already formed, so awesome. we are starting to plan already. Yep. Thank you. You should, Perfect, you should yeah. definitely start planning and actually get the word out. So if you have um, um, local leaders that actually can help you to get the, the word out for you or um, associations that can actually get the word out for you, you should actually reach out to them and actually say, hey, I have this program, I want to help um, people um, from ages and this and this and what I'm actually trying to do. Send them an email do cold calling, do um, what is necessary to actually get your project out. And don't rush it. Just take your time and, um, yeah, have like a timeline, but don't um, have it too quick because you don't want to rush into it. So take time to think through it and actually um, have it all planned out and just go for it. Yeah. And also, one thing that I just want to add is when thinking about these programs and we thought about it on the design thinking is how to empathize in having a human-centered approach so thinking about not only assuming what you can offer, but also what actually they need. For example, why is the problem of the trash in the streets affecting you know, the people or their health? What is it that they need so that they will stop littering, for example? Or what is it that they need so that they can have more inclusion? Maybe it's not a problem about facilities not being accessible to them, but maybe about people not having interest in participating. So you know, the, the facilities are there, but they're not being used. So you also need to think about from, an, from a user experience and empathize about it through the process. And this will take us to the next part of the process. Oh. So now that you have your idea. Anyone else? Or anyone else yeah, has in another question or another problem that Thank they thought you. about that they would like to share it? 
Anyone? Okay. okay. I think we're good. Okay. So as I was mentioning now, we are ready to actually move into like the prototyping, let's say, of, of a product. We can call it product or we can call it service. How do we want to solve the problem? So for example, going back to the litter uh, or you know the trash in the street, one of the things is, okay, you have people now picking up the trash, but what if there is no trash cans in the streets or there is no recycling or there is no sorting? What, what are they gonna do? You know, they're not gonna just grab it and keep it and, and go home with it. So, so you need to think about a full like product or service that you can implement trying to go through this process of ideas. And as he mentioned in the beginning, this is not a straight line process. So maybe you have a solution already and you want to implement it, but then you realize it's not working. So you're back into the ideation process. What else can you change in order to achieve your end goal? So think about, we have the example of you know littering in the streets. We have the example of promoting more inclusion. So now try to take that problem a step further into how either through a service or the product, you could try to solve this problem. So let's take it a, a little bit further. We'll give you some time to think about it. Yeah. So about five minutes. So in this part, we actually want you to not go through the loop, maybe think about ways that you actually can create a prototype for your project. Could be really a simple one. Could be starting um, a boot camp, or it could be creating a, um, a trash Awareness can. Awareness campaign. Yeah, a campaign. About sorting, yeah. yeah a, a small campaign. Um, it could be a social media campaign as well. So it's more of just um, thinking through the process and actually, um, yeah, thinking how you can actually prototype your service and um, ex um, product. Yep. Yep. So we'll give you again like five to ten minutes to think about it, and then we, will share. And then we can share again. Okay. Yep. Um. I don't really have a lot, just a few simple ideas. Right. So we're uh, thinking of starting small in school, like for example, doing some fundraisers or holding some um, workshops and some class challenges maybe. And then we're thinking of doing a social media campaign as well with some newsletters, like every two weeks probably. Nice. I think what you have is you've really thought it through and you have like a lot of... Um, solutions and you can actually pick whichever that works and make it all work together as well. So I think it's, it's a really great start. Yep. Yeah, also, I think the fundraising that you mentioned is important because you want it to be sustainable. So then maybe you can think into a way of making it self-sustainable or something that you can do so you are not always relying on, you know, like asking for money or trying to find money. Uh, also, another example that we would like to share, it's uh, what we were thinking about, for example, the problem of the trash in the streets, is that you can create a pilot program that you can select a community that, you know, a neighborhood, a particular neighborhood or, or a school in which you think this is happening, and then you can actually try to put um, some trash cans that are transparent, for example, that they are easy for people to see them, so they know where they can go to throw the trash, and they can sort it. And then you can actually identify what is the type of trash that is being wasted the most so that you can try to understand, like, why is it plastic, is it paper, and what could you do then after with the trash that is being collected, depending if it can be recycled or not. Yep. And then maybe you could start also earning money from that because you can work with recycle uh, um, people in organizations and they can actually collect trash from you as well and give you money at the same time. Yeah, and I think it's important always also that you start with a pilot so that you can notice what is working and what is not. You know, if you put the trash can there, does it help for people to actually throw the trash in the right place or not? And then you take back your idea and you think about it. Okay, if it's working, then you can take it the next step. If not, then you have to rethink how to make it work or maybe this is not the appropriate solution or product for your problem. Um, so thank you, everyone. Really, we enjoyed this. I hope that you learned something new. Um, that you can apply. Yes, thank you so much for participating in this um, workshop and sharing your ideas as well. Um, we appreciate it so much and uh, we hope to see you soon um, somewhere. <laughs> yeah, but um, anytime if you would like to speak to us, um, we are always around and you can talk to us as well. Yes, and as you know, we have a lot of resources on the IOC Young Leaders channel. We like to share our knowledge as well. 
so you can find useful information about how to start your own project, how to do design thinking, how to do budgeting, or many other things. So follow our network. You can get more information. Feel free to get in touch. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks.